Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. My name is Michael Roberts. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and with the uh, Center for Maritime Strategy at the uh, Navy League. And uh, before introducing our guest, I want to just take a minute to introduce you to a new maritime research program, which is a joint effort of Hudson Institute's uh, Center for Defense Concepts and Technology and the Maritime uh, Center for Maritime Strategy of the Navy League, which is led by uh, Admiral Fogo. Uh, the focus of this project is to develop uh, recommended policy changes uh, that will help make the American commercial maritime industry more capable and effective uh, in dealing with the new geopolitical challenges that we face today, particularly those involving China. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more uh, about uh, this program, please reach out uh, to me at mroberts uh, at hudson.org or join the, um, join the contact list. I'd be happy to put you on and, and discuss the program with you. Our plan is to do research papers and op-eds and uh, events uh, like this one uh, to explore dis different aspects of the uh, American maritime, of American maritime policy. Uh, the format for this event will be simple, uh, simple conversation for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions from those who are online with us today. And we could not have a better person to lead off uh, this, uh, these discussions than Admiral Mark Busby, who is reporting in today from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, after teaching a ship handling course this morning. Welcome, Admiral Busby. Good to be with you, Mike. Good. Um, let me do a, a little bit more on the introduction. Admiral Busby is a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, uh, a couple years younger than I am. He graduated in 1979 at Kings Point, um, uh, several years of distinguished service in the Navy, uh, and was appointed the, the commander of the Military Sealift Command in 2009. Uh, Admiral Busby retired from active service in 2013. Uh, spent a few years uh, leading the National Defense Transportation Association uh, before reporting uh, again for duty as the head of the Maritime Administration under President Trump. Admiral Busby, thank you for your service and thank you for being our first guest in this discuss discussion si series. Thanks, Mike. Good to be with you all. Thanks for uh, the honor of being number one. Great. Okay. So this, this conversation uh, today is about uh, sea lift involving uh, a maritime confrontation involving China, and a Western Pacific confrontation, um, the sea lift challenges that we would face there, to sort of set a baseline uh, and take and and make sure that uh, all the viewers, most online now, are sea lift and the and the the need for it, but to make sure we have a baseline and a little bit of context for what we're looking at in the Pacific. Let, if you wouldn't mind, Adam, we'll take a, a, a minute or two to talk about um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the recent experience we've had with sea lift in, in conflicts involving maybe starting with uh, Operation Desert Storm in, in 1990, Desert Shield in 1990. Sure. Um, first, great, great to be with everybody today and uh, happy to be talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I certainly testified a bunch before Congress about it um, while I was uh, the administrator. But, um, you know, our recent sea lift experience, um, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, uh, in 1991, uh, one that went not as good and one that went much better in 2003 timeframe for uh, desert, uh, for uh, uh, our second Gulf War. Um, However, both of those were in a non-contested environment, and that's probably the biggest distinction to make here is, you know, while those were in benign environments, all we had to do was get out of our own way. All we had to do was have enough bottoms to move the Iron Mountain uh, of uh, materiel uh, to the war zone, get it offloaded, and get it ready for the line of debarkation, and then and then repeat. Uh, you know, the first time we tried it in two, uh, 1991 for Desert Shield and Desert Storm was using essentially legacy sea lift vessels, many of which were left over from uh, World War II and Korean vintage, part of the National Defense Reserve Fleet, which uh, was fairly large, uh, had a lot of victory ships and, and older 
uh, in it. Uh, and when we went to activate those, um, you know, not surprisingly, not all of them activated smoothly. Um, and we had some real growing pains getting those ships online and, and moving. And uh, the bigger problem was mariners, finding mariners uh, to crew the ships, especially as we grew in numbers, uh, and the, uh, uh, as the size of the sea lift grew. In some cases, some of the ships that were chosen to activate never made it. Uh, they, they were in such poor condition, they just never did. So, and, and you know, what was even more uh, startling was we did not have enough sea lift. We had to reach out to foreign flag carriers uh, upwards of 40 ships, as I recall, um, to carry our uh, war fighting goods forward. And um, in many cases, some of those ships did refuse the mission. They loaded, and once they got into the war zone, manned by foreign nationals, they refused to execute the mission uh, and turned around, and those ships had to be offloaded and reloaded into American bottoms. So that was a real eye opener there. By the time, so so that was carefully looked at uh, after after the war was over, and um, when it came time to do it again in 2003, we had learned some some significant lessons. Um, in 1996, we essentially recapitalized our sea lift forces. We drew down the NDRF into a subset called the Ready Reserve Force of ships that we were gonna maintain in five day readiness, very much higher state of readiness, newer ships, uh, recapitalized militarily useful uh, properties um, and had them at a very high readiness state. I think we started off in the order of uh, 60 or 70 and that kind of actually uh, in recent times has gotten boiled down to about 46 uh, ships, 45 today actually. We also built uh, modified and built a class of ship called the LMSR, large medium speed roll on roll off ship, which was a Conroe type ship, um, very large ship, 980 feet, fast, uh, 24 uh, knots, uh, diesel and gas turbine, but uh, could carry all of the military uh, material very quickly and, uh, and get it there on time. And we had our uh, crews sized accordingly. So that sea lift went very, very well. Um, but as I said, uh, now those are both in benign environments. Now we're gonna have somebody shooting at us more than likely. That changes the whole calculus. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, let me, so we're gonna talk about uh, uh, the potential for uh, the, the, the sea lift challenges in a, in a uh, military confrontation involving China. Let me preface that with two or three points, Admiral, if you don't mind. And you can agree or disagree or elaborate as you see fit. Uh, first, I think it's important to say this is not about the Chinese people. It's about the, the Chinese Communist Party, which is leading the Chinese government and has uh, aspirations uh, uh, to uh, uh, displace the United States as the global leader. Uh, we hope that our trade relationship between the two countries is so strong that uh, it makes a, a, a military confrontation uh, simply too ex expensive and, and, and infeasible. Uh, that's a reasonable hope, but as they say, hope isn't a strategy. And, and uh, there have certainly been instances in history where uh, countries that have very strong trading relationships nevertheless uh, end up shooting at each other. Um, many military leaders uh, believe uh, that, uh, a, a, that a military action by uh, China to, quote, reunify uh, Taiwan with the Chinese mainland is, is uh, likely to happen. Uh, some would say within the next two years, some would say within the next 10 years, a majority would say that. It's not inevitable, but if that were to happen and be successful, the experts that I listen to uh, uh, sort of say that would be very bad news for the United States. We would be back where we were in, in terms of having two global superpowers, nuclear armed, and back where we were in, in probably in a worse position than we were during the Cold War. Um, one other, I guess, another point is that, you know, American forces would much more likely be directly involved in an activation in uh, involving Taiwan, that uh, we wouldn't be able to send uh, our weapons 
uh, and hope that, uh, and, and not hope, but, but have them deployed by a very effective uh, fighting force in, as they have been in Ukraine, we would, there would, it's much more likely that there would be American ships and American airplane, American service members involved in defending Taiwan if it's going to be successful. So we have an American defense a deference, a deterrence wall that was set up and, and, uh, and, and in my mind, uh, logistics is a key part of that wall. And, and so with that sort of as background, you want to talk a little bit about the sort of the sea lift uh, challenges we face in, in the Pacific, sir. Yeah, well, clearly the obvious one is just the tyranny of distance. It's a long way to go to get out there. Whatever, you know, absent any forces you may have forward. And hopefully we will have gotten enough strategic uh, heads up that, you know, there is movement in that direction so that we could begin our buildup. Um, but still, it's gonna take a long time. And, you know, to, to move what will likely ne be necessary to be moved out there in terms of war stocks and not just forces, but sustainment for those forces, it's gonna take a, a gigantic effort. And to be, you know, I think we all need to be eyes wide open here that the Chinese have certainly uh, studied what we have been doing, how we have done our logistics, how we have done our sea lift in the past, and are, I am certain, already have a plan to uh, interdict that. Um, so, and then actually, where are we going to build up our force? You know, where where is our footprint going to be? I know Admiral Papero, uh, uh, PAC, uh, uh, Indo PAC is looking at this. He mentioned it in a speech not uh, just a few weeks ago, but he's looking at it very, very seriously, which is, I think, a very refreshing thing to hear a combatant commander uh, talking about that and talking about it, uh, you know, in, in those kinds of terms that he knows that could be very well the linchpin, the shortcoming to our success or failure in any kind of an operation we're going to have out there. But um, you then throw in the new um, operating doctrines that both the Navy and the Marine Corps have introduced lately, distributed maritime operations for uh, the Navy, spreading out their forces, uh, uh, you know, much more broadly than the, than the old traditional all formed around the carrier battle group type, type of operation. And then the Marines having their expeditionary uh, uh, new uh, way of doing business where small uh, groups are going to be on disparate islands interdicting, uh, potentially interdicting Chinese forces. So keeping them supplied, sustained, uh, and delivered, you know, those are, those in of themselves are two new logistic challenges on top of just the traditional challenge of getting it there and now getting it there in a contested environment. It's, uh, you know, this is a much more challenging calculus potentially this time around. You mentioned uh, when we talked earlier, you mentioned Admiral Paparo's uh, uh, comments around the defense, uh, I'm sorry, the distributed maritime operations and expeditionary advanced base operations and, and, the, and the challenge of, of logistics there. He, he also mentioned in the article that I read uh, the notion uh, that uh, uh, logistics uh, seem to be uh, more or less business driven. It was all about efficiency uh, before, yep. and it's maybe different now. You want to uh, talk about that? Yeah, that, that's that's exactly true. Uh, you know, when the when we graduated back in the early '90s from a Cold War sort of mentality to a peace dividend sort of mentality, that shift occurred there. The effectiveness versus efficiency shift occurred. You saw saw it across um, you know the in industry. We saw it in forces, uh, whereby it was a consolidation, shrinking down, uh, and doing things that were more affordable, uh, as opposed to potentially more effective. You know, if you could get some affordability out of better effectiveness, all the better. But clearly, the focus was on efficiency, vice effectiveness. Well, when you when you do that, the the bottom line is is you shrink your capacity. You shrink your resilience, uh, your ability to be resilient, and your excess kind of goes away. The pool gets smaller. I don't care where you're talking about people or material. It's now a smaller pool to draw from. 
and that's been the way it's been, you know, for now 30, 40 years. So we have to shift that around now. We have to kind of get refocused on the fact that we need that effectiveness back in there. We have to now rapidly rebuild and pay for uh, building more effectiveness, a, you know, more resiliency back into our, uh, our forces uh, to get there. And, you know, we haven't talked about manning yet, and I'm, I'm sure we will, but you know, all of the talking about ships and everything else is a great discussion, but without the people to, you know, to drive them, to man them, and even even with degrees of automation introduced in, you're still going to have, you know, a great, in my mind, that's going to be the greatest shortage right now is producing those people because you don't produce a senior maritime person overnight. That's a 10-year thing to get to be a master or chief engineer, and, and we don't have 10 years. Um, yeah, uh, by by many accountings. Yeah, thinking about the um, uh, again the um, distributed maritime op operations, um, it, and the and the logistics challenges they have there, and then putting that in the context of this efficiency versus effectiveness uh, uh, trade off uh, that that you mentioned. Um, I mean, sort of the, the 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 cheapest way to get quote sea lift uh, is foreign flag ships. Um, presumably, uh, though perhaps it's, I think that the common understanding would be the least reliable. Uh, and when you have U.S. troops and U.S. national security interests uh, uh, at, at, at risk, uh, you want something that's reliable. Uh, the most expensive way would be with you know, Navy gray hulls, I presume. And it, it, I think that's pretty well understood. And you have probably you have the highest degree of reliability there and somewhere in between there probably very close from a cost perspective, close to the uh, foreign flag operations is US commercial, US flag vessels and, 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 and a high degree of reliability and relatively low cost. So uh, I'm wondering when you think about the DMO and the, and the um, EAD, EABO and, and other, other challenges in the, in the Western Pacific operations, uh, what role US flag commercial uh, sea lift will play in that as as compared to you know foreign flag and or um, uh, navy gray holes. Yeah, uh, I, I think they're going to play a whether they like it or not a significant role, but because they have to. You know, we have a yeah. total of nineteen combat logistics force ships in the navy and the military sea lift command. Those are the unrep oilers and the unrep ammo ships, dry cargo ships. Um, that are available that are going to be running and doing the delivery with you know, most of the forces, but um, you know that's not going to be enough. And that's before we talk about attrition. That's that's if they all show up, and that's before they start, you know, becoming torpedo sponges, uh, which they will be very high priority targets for, uh, you know, any uh, any foe Chinese for sure. And, and quite frankly, if distributed maritime operations pans out the way we think it's going to be. There just are not enough combat logistics force ships to go out and meet those disparate groups all over the you know dispersed battle battlefield. There just won't be. So yeah. you know it's going to take some commercial assets um, with capabilities that they don't have right now, you know, abilities to transfer at sea. Uh, you know, we talk uh, tankers, we have uh, had some uh, Unrep capability, uh, underway replenishment capability added to some uh, tankers in the past that has worked quite well. It's you know, modular, put the king post on, the, uh, the winches and everything come in a 20 foot container, plans on deck, uh, and, and away you go uh, with, with the hoses and such so that those can be sustaining our combat logistics ships. Dry cargo, a little bit more challenging. Back in the break bulk days, we had cargo rigs we could send across, you know, those don't live anymore. So it's pretty tough to get a container back and forth, um, you know, absent a heavy lift helicopter or something like that. Um, so, you know, that that still has to be kind of figured out and worked out. I think there's great promise, in my view, a lot of our oil field supply vessels uh, that are used to transferring goods. I think, you know, a lot of tankage, deck space, they, they could be pressed into service. To go service one or two ships, you know, in a very uh, boutique uh, 
uh, sort of sort of way, you know, in a small acreage someplace or, or or somewhere where they could handle the logistics chores for those. So I think we will have to get creative. I think we have fleets out there that can do that, ships that can be modified to do that kind of a distributed sort of mission. Same thing with the Marines. You know, a vessel like that could easily, you know, service uh, you know a small uh, Marine garrison on a, on an island, get in close, put the stuff ashore, and and, and be out of there. Uh, but you know, it's kind of mean putting ships that aren't typically combat ships into forward areas, um, and that's going to be you know that's going to harken back to the days of World War II, where we ask our civilian mariners to go forth in peace and war, and uh, you know, go into some pretty dangerous areas. Yeah, we talked a little bit earlier uh, about um, uh, the different ways that those ships can be, uh, you know, defenses that would be available for those ships. Um, you know, we use convoys uh, with uh, escorts in, in World War II. Um, I presume there'd be some of that, but there'd be, there's other uh, other approaches to defending uh, merchant ships that are under discussion or whatever. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, a little bit. I, I, I've i said, and based on conversations I've had with Navy folks, you know, we're in all likelihood not going to have sufficient escorts in all likelihood to, uh, you know, do big convoy kind of sort of movements. I think there's going to be a lot more individual ships uh, moving. There may be some, but most of the ships, uh, you know, that we have today, again, we've drawn forces down they're shooters, you know, we need their missile tubes forward, um, not necessarily available for escort kind of operations. I see an escort role, quite frankly, for autonomous vessels. I think they could be adapted pretty readily. Uh, you know, some of the vessels that we're experimenting with right now, some of the larger ones to serve as a screen for one or more uh, merchant vessels that are going either by being sensors for them or carrying um, defensive weapons, be it a, a small caliber gun or anti-torpedo torpedo that could be uh, controlled from, you know, the mothership, if you will, the ship being screened uh, with, a, with a, a, a tactical advisor on board, a strategic sea left officer that's serving as a back ad that could be essentially the weapons control kind of officer to afford some level of defense for those ships that wouldn't otherwise get it. I think that technology is probably uh, readily adaptable and could be pressed into service pretty quickly. We could, we have enough yard capacity left in this in the country that we can make smaller vessels like that in numbers. Uh, and there's enough uh, autumn, you know, technology companies around that can put their kit on board and have a, a you know, I think a reasonably effective capability pretty soon interesting so so just to uh take a step back uh if we can in terms of looking at the number of ships and we will definitely talk about mariners uh which is critical um critical part of this but but uh, if we could walk through the numbers that that were um that we're really talking about here in terms of the of the ships uh, that we think we need commercial ships. Uh, we have 85 today, 85 U.S. flagships uh, in the global international uh, commercial fleet of 50,000 ships. Uh, I presume we need all of those uh, for under under some scenarios for national security reasons. Keep, keeping in mind that 60 of those are already MSP, Maritime Security Program ships. They're already signed up and getting a stipend call come when we call them right right so that, that and that program is built around the the business efficiency model basically uh, in, in my opinion and they're in there but but that's that's the baseline we have that's the the nucleus of our commercial capability right now in in, in right. international markets uh, and then we we're all aware i believe of the uh, of this the need for um, at least 86, the number I hear is 100 additional tankers, more than double the, the, the size of the fleet we have today uh, of tankers. Uh, any comment on that one? Yeah, that's for sure. We, we have the uh, dry side, if you will, the, the rolling stock and dry, dry stores, that sort of thing, non-petroleum. Uh, 
Um, we we have we Transcom and was ultimately responsible for producing that capability as the square footage pretty close uh, as long as everybody shows up. Uh, we, we've got what we think we need to move the Iron Mountain. The, the, the piece of it that's less well-defined and less well-served is the, uh, the petroleum oil lubricating side, uh, the bulk fuel, uh, which you know MSC has a total of five tankers, commercial tankers under charter right now. So that represents the government lift, if you will, that we have at our fingertips right now. Uh, you know, if you if you want to throw in the Jones Act uh, medium range tankers that are sailing around, about 50 feet of them or so, I think is kind of where we are on that. If you were to rip them all out of domestic trade uh, and put them in, uh, you know, you're still short uh, by by dozens of the required fuel lift, uh, again, before attrition. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're gonna have to get more tankers from someplace. Uh, you know, the recently introduced tanker security program, that's 10 ships, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, I think the uh, applications closed out on yesterday or day before yesterday for the first 10. Uh, and talking with the administrator a couple of days ago, she assured me there were a lot of ships that had, um, you know, thrown in to be a part of that. That's another step in that direction um, and 10 more authorized for next year. So hopefully we're up to about 20 uh, or so, uh, you know, in a few, in a couple of more years. So we're starting to nibble at the right number there, but we still have a ways to go. And oh, by the way, where are the mariners that we're gonna use to man those ships? You know, currently they're far and flag, uh, the majority of those ships. So those are going to have to be U.S. crews that come aboard uh, and man those ships. And you know, I, I from my conversations with industry, many of whom are on this call here today, there's real challenges in in manning just the ships we have today. Uh, and you know, you talk about getting finding a bunch of tankermen that uh, you know have capability and qualifications to sail uh, these ships. Um, you know, again, more challenge. Uh, so we find ourselves bare bones here in this in this area particularly, um, and so you know the the old answer was always well we'll just call on the effective U.S. control of of ships. You know there's a lot of U.S. companies that own tankers that are all flagged out and going other places doing other things, uh, and 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 once upon a time that would have been I think a good answer and a valid assumption. I don't think that's a very valid assumption these days, given the way vessels are owned, leased, uh, crewed, managed. I mean, there are so now, there are now so many layers between the owner of the vessel and who actually is operating the vessel and who's on board operating the vessel um, that, you know, saying that there is effective U.S. control over it, I think gets to be a bit of a shaky uh, proposition. <laughs> Um, I, the the, um, the questions, uh, I, I, I hate to keep bringing you back to this because I do want to talk a little bit more about the Mariners, uh, but, but the issue, but, but if, we're at, if we're at 85 now and we know we need to get to at least 185 uh, in international trade, and I, I recognize that, uh, you know, if the flag went up today, we'd have to look at Jones Act ships, but that's not a very good planning scenario unless we, you know, have no choice. Um, um, and they'd have, and so to be we, back, they'd have to be backfilled with foreign flag and uh, right, you know. right. They're not they're not meant for that. I mean, they they they, they would be uh, available, you know, in a true war setting. But but so that that goes from eighty five to one hundred and eighty five, and then you know the number we're talking about for distributed maritime operations, whether they're 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 uh, the um, uh, work boats. Um, there's another number of vessels there that that uh, would be uh, addition in addition to the 185 we've already identified, and we haven't even talked about the concept of economic security and the importance 
you know, and, and the fact that, you know, we have, we as a country have no control over our maritime logistics supply chain in, in peacetime, zero, almost zero. Yep. Um, and the law says we're supposed to have, um, we're U.S. flag commercial fleet supposed to carry a substantial part of our import export cargoes. And if we're at 1%, I don't think we're meeting the legal standards. So in any event, that, that to, to my mind, ought to, ought to add a, a pretty good number of ships that we need to, to support um, uh, on top of the 185 plus 25 or whatever the number is. And, and then, so, it, it, you know, if we sort of add all of that up in terms of the number of US flagships that we should have to have an effective deterrent um, in the context of a uh, Chinese military activation, um, would we be out of line to say that should be 250 ships? Yeah, I, I just wrote down 250. That's the number that's in my mind as well. And, and you know, for for both the military need to support, you know, the, the the defense sort of side of the house, but just to have, you know, the the world credibility of of having uh, your flag flying off of a vessel on a routine basis in many of these foreign ports. Uh, you know, to um, assure our allies that we're out there, we're trading, we are serious you know, about our maritime posture, um, and and having a presence in sometimes challenging waters lends uh, credence to our argument that we have a right to be talking about it. You know, if we sailing in the South China Sea, you know, there there's not a whole lot of U.S. flag ships. That are over there on a regular basis. There are ships, you know, obviously sailing there or they're on liner service, but as it, it's more of a rarity when you take a survey on a port on any given day, Singapore, you know, Kaohsiung, wherever you want to do to find, you know, the number of U.S. flag ships, you could easily count it on one hand if, you know, and, and probably have some to spare. So if you want to lend, I think, uh, credibility to your, 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 um, argument that you know we deserve to be in this area we work we trade in this area we're there regularly it's not just our gray ships sailing through during freedom and navigation operations it's our commercial assets you know free trading moving through that area and that neighborhood on a regular basis that has a deterrent effect i think all in itself and we're missing out on that right now big time sort of a commercial freedom of navigation um, exercise yeah. 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 So, um, you know, there's there's the two sides of it. I mean, back when I was still at Marad, we someone would ask me, how many more ships do we need under U.S. flag? Now, I had by that time, I had boiled it down to enough ships to give me enough people to man the ships that we had, which that number was 40. We, we used to say 40 ships. So, uh, you know, that would give us another couple of hundred people, which would, you know, give us a little bit of leeway, a little bit of room. To uh, you know, to man uh, the the ready reserve for ships that we had already, let alone uh, you know anything else. So uh, you know, two fifty is a much more realistic number that takes in to account both the in peace and war uh, sides of it, both the defense side and the economic security piece. Yeah, and and that seems like a lot when you're when you're talking about a fleet that's now at eighty five ships, it's triple the the fleet, but but it's but it's also uh, only you know a, a quarter larger than what we've what uh, has clearly been identified as the need when you take the tankers and the, uh, and, the, the and sadly tankers. there are shipping lines in this world that have more ships sailing under their house flag than this number we're talking about than our right. national fleet. Right, right. So 250 ships would require about 10,000 trained American mariners. Um, um, uh, do we have, how, how are we doing in terms of, of adding a new, you know, what's it going to take? Obviously, we don't have the ship, we don't have the 250 uh, ships at this point. Uh, we do have a good infrastructure of education built up um, uh, that would need to be expanded. But, but you know, what do we need to do to get that and how much time will it take to, to get that done? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you can grow, you know, uh, junior officers and unlicensed folks fairly quickly. Uh, you know, third, we, we turn out about 1,100 
new third mates and third assistant engineers every year out of this out of Kings Point and the state Mar six state maritime academies. So you know there's there's 1,100 people that um, essentially join join the ranks every year. Problem is is at the senior ranks. Uh, you know some of the senior unlicensed folks and you know first assistants, chief mates, masters, and chief engineers. You know you're talking eight to ten years to grow them. Those don't happen overnight, uh, and they they have to have berths to sail uh, in order to build that time to to get there, and that's. Uh, been part of the problem that we have seen is because the fleet has shrunk down so significantly, the availability of sailing berths has, you know, also shrunk down. So mm -hmm. having that nice clear path to go sail, get as much time as you need, upgrade straight away and get up to the senior ranks uh, has been difficult. Plus, uh, you know, the institution of uh, STCW and all of the uh, assessments and, requir and requirements that come along with that when you upgrade uh, and, and maintain your uh, your credential uh, is, is, you know, it's not inexpensive. And if you're not sailing, it's very difficult to justify laying out, you know, five or 7,000 bucks to upgrade or to maintain that credential uh, if you're not sailing. So, you know, a lot of people have let that, you know, uh, Fall, fall away, uh, and uh, you know, understandable. Well, we need, we, didn't didn't we, used to be that way in the old days. You know, yeah. the old days you got your radar observer upgraded, and away you went. You know, that's where the eighty-year-old navigator, you know, on one of the fast sea lift ships back during a Desert Storm came from. You know, he still had his license, hadn't been to sea in thirty years, still had his license. Went and got his radar observer uh, <laughs> upgraded. You know, got a new prescription for his glasses, I guess, and. Went out to sea. He couldn't <laughs> climb the steps to get up to the bridge, but you know, I mean, that was an extreme case. But we're we're in that situ situation now. We have about twelve thousand five hundred up to date practicing mariners today, right now, which is about what the fleet pool uh, supports. Um, you know, but to grow, to grow that, that, we need we need the ships. Yeah, yeah. And we, we need, need we need places for them to practice their trade to, to sail. <clears throat> Or, or else have the Coast Guard significantly modify the standard by which they remain qualified. Uh, you know, if we got into an emergency situation, you know, who knows, potentially that that would have, there might be some waivers yeah. there uh, or something. Right. Um, I've got two, two more questions and then we'll open it up to others. Um, um, we, uh, if we would like to talk to, about our current uh, government structure uh, for overseeing the American Maritime with Maritime, MARAD uh, as the lead agency, um, uh, pretty far down the org chart at, at DOT, um, the, the Pentagon funding the program um, and, and sort of their sort of built in conflict in, in the sense of any, any dollars that go to, to commercial maritime come out of their uh, budget and, and other priorities that they may have. Is 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 there a better way to sort of organize um, how the government manages this industry? Oh, there's got to be because <laughs> the current <laughs> one isn't working so working so hot. Um, now I think uh, my predecessor, Chip Janikin, uh, would agree with me in in that uh, you know Marad just does not have the authorities that that our predecessor organizations once had. Uh, you know, I've said on many occasions. My World War II predecessor, Admiral Emery S. Land, who was a maritime administrator, he used to be able to call a phone and talk to FDR. I mean, you know, they, they talk shipbuilding and, and, and uh, manning and the whole U.S. maritime uh, service. Uh, you know, that was all of that power was resident in one organization, the Maritime Commission. Uh, you know, post-war, that got split up into Federal Maritime Commission and the Maritime Administration. And over time, a lot of the authorities that once were resident in the Maritime Administration have been diluted, either pulled up to Secretary of Commerce or Transportation, depending on where we lived. Um, and and of course, we're we're not MARAD is not the regulatory body; that's the Coast Guard's uh, authority and Federal Maritime Commission. Uh, so, um, you know, Maritimes 
interests in this country are so diluted across so many different cabinet levels. Uh, you know, you have DOD, you have DOT, you have uh, DHS uh, for Jones Act uh, and kind of enforcement, Department of State for aid. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And and the problem, the problem with um, the maritime ministry is, you know, we we have two missions. We have a wartime mission, we have a peacetime mission, and those two missions reside in different departments. So we end up kind of falling through the cracks. Uh, you know, who who? How do we get funded? Do we get funded to our wartime kind of requirement DOD, or do we get funded kind of to our uh, peacetime kind of requirement? Commerce and energy and transportation and, and the rest of the departments that all have a piece, but but don't want to fund. So uh, you know, I I found this out the hard way, as did Chip, when we tried to put together a national maritime strategy. You know, who's in charge? Well, it certainly wasn't Marad. We found that out. You know, in very clearly, um, it, it really has to these days. That's sort of risen up to I would say National Security Council level it's certainly white house level stuff now where that sort of resides so so who should be in charge well marad could be in charge if everybody kind of stacked hands and agreed but that doesn't exist right now yeah so, you know in realistic terms if, some, if the decision had to get made today it would have to get refereed at national security council level my opinion right right well, and that's certainly not a knock on the on the folks who are doing the best they can at, at Marat today and have been all the way through. Hard. We all have very flat heads over there from banging our heads against the wall. <laughs> okay. we, we know what needs to get done and we want to do it, but there it's difficult to, to muster uh, resources or attention to the, the problem. Yeah, understood. Um, okay, well, I'm not sure exactly how to, to referee this, but I, I am going to open it up. Um, and, and welcome uh, questions or comments from folks on the call at this time. Christian. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, I was going to ask uh, Admiral Busby, thank you for your time. Um, wanted to know if you had other suggestions that haven't been mentioned with regard to growing the fleet over and above the TSP, that seems to be the obvious way things are going right now. But are there other suggestions that you would have um, if you were uh, given all those authorities back like in World War II? Yeah. You know, I, I think, thank, thanks Good. Thanks for the question, Christian, and I could see you. Um, you know, I, I think it would be great if there could be, an, if there was economic incentive for companies to want to flag under US flag, if there was the business for them to carry, if there was a product for them to carry that for the government uh, that incentivized, much like um, uh, you know cargo preference, if there was if there was more of that, I think that would be business incentive to be under U.S. flag rather than, I'd rather have it kind of that way rather than trying to drive people uh, to be under U.S. flag. If there was a good reason for them to be under U.S. flag, I think that would be the best of all worlds. Um, so. To the extent that we can incentivize uh, companies to, uh, you know, flag in uh, either through tax incentives or, you know, stipend, kind of like the MSP, or which is essentially the way TSP is, is going to work. Um, you know, we all know it's an uneven, uneven playing field out there. Uh, we're the only ones trying to play fair, and with all the other, uh, you know, countries and shipping companies for the most most part offering breaks for people. Um, you know, it kind of puts our folks at a real disadvantage. So I, I think, you know, uh, that's probably the, the simplest answer I can give you. It's probably a lot more in-depth, people smarter than me can think of better ways. But I think if you just make it business sense, make a good business case for companies to come in and flag in, that's probably the most enduring way to do it. So I, I, it's a really good question. and and um, and and. I would just add, I think uh, the way to get to 250 ships, if that's the target, uh, it, there are lots of options and, and um, um, you know, maybe a commercial cargo preference way, it may be an expanded TSP, it may be a combination of different things. And 
Uh, and I think um, there's going to be a lot of discussion and input into that. But but uh, the starting place is what's the target? It seems to me, it, it, you know, if, if yeah. there's a target of 250 ships, let's let's have a conversation about the best way to get there, and, uh, yeah, just, and how quickly. Just, we can do it. just saying, we need you at wartime. You know, that, that's not that's a it's a good argument. It's a valid argument. But how about the rest of the time? You know, we we need you around. There, there needs to be something for you to do, and every companies understand that, and, and I understand that. I'm not going to just make you flag in for the sake of flagging in. There's a cost associated with that, and we're, as we all know, you know, why sale under farm flag. So that, that's there's got to be a business case there. Well, thank yeah. you very much, Admiral. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Other other questions or comments? Chip. Hey, Buzz, uh, thanks for your comments and uh, for your longstanding support uh, for the maritime industry. Um, during your uh, initial comments with regards to the autonomous vessels, you, you highlighted, you know, the escort, uh, you know, possibility from a sensors and defensive weapons standpoint. But, you know, as the Marine Corps gets more expeditionary, you know, I, I liken it to island hopping by already being on the island. Um, you know, the autonomous vessel, you know, disposable type vessels that could service some of those distributed forces uh, might be an opportunity. Hey, can you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, thanks for the question, Chip. Um, and thank you for your service, too. And uh, um, yeah, certainly, you know, having something that could drive up on the beach or drive, you know, make a landing or, or you know, show up at one of those forward uh, operating bases. Uh, you know, without having to hazard a bunch of people. Uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me as well. Uh, you could have some sort of automated, uh, you know, medium landing ship or something that could go do that. Um, that, that I think there's a lot of uh, potential for that as well, yeah, for sure. Okay, floor is open. Uh, Bob, Bob Rice. Hi, thank you, Admiral. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to meet with us today. One of the things I'm, I'm hearing is that um, basically we're, we're looking at an approach of if you build it, they will come. And I just don't know if that's um, as far as the mariners, the officers and the mariners to crew these ships that we're anticipating coming online. I think we have to get much better at recruiting and I'm not quite sure what that looks like. Um, our maritime academies, we're starting to see a migration towards the Gulf of Mexico for the greener pastures out there and that sort of thing. So um, I, I believe those jobs are very cyclical you know, as everybody knows, um, yep. you know, there's feasts and famine out there that the jobs come mm -hmm. and they go, um, you know, the unions offer stability. So I think we have to sell that message a lot better. And I'd, I'd love to hear your comments on that, Admiral, and, and what your thoughts are. Yeah, uh, Bob, thanks. Thanks for the comments. Uh, an area that I am um, got my fingers in, uh, in other places, uh, you know, the, the, U.S. Maritime Service back in the World War II, that's exactly what they did. They went out and they recruited, they beat bushes, they tried to get people, you know, another great shortage of people back then and getting people to sail. And, uh, you know, we had that was a government entity that did that. Uh, we don't have a government entity. Still on the books, could be activated if the secretary wanted to, uh, but it's, uh, you know, probably not gonna. So, you know, to me, we need a similar sort of effort, uh, potentially from industry that uh, maybe gets together, because all of you, all you know, unions, uh, shipping companies, everybody, you're all out there trying to get people. You're all out there trying to recruit people. And you get them in and you, you know, they get trained up and then they become free agents. You know, they kind of go all over the place. So it's tough to kind of justify kind of an investment sometime. You get kind of a, uh, you know, a front organization uh, that does that recruiting that goes out and beats those bushes that, you know, does the promotions on, you know, media or TV or whatever to get people interested in maritime careers and then just shows them the door and they matriculate through, you know, any number of the training pipelines uh, 
uh, that are out there and then show up in the fleet. Uh, you know, I think I think the time has come. We got to do something like that. And I know there are a couple of nascent efforts underway uh, right now uh, that I'm aware of that are kind of focused on that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Yeah, you bet. Just not on TikTok, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Good. Any any more questions? We're getting toward the end of the hour here. Any more questions or comments? You know, the, I'll, I'll just, while we're waiting for, sure. and just to kind of sort of put a final point on that we haven't really talked about, and that's the industrial base, the shipbuilding side of this, uh, which, uh, you know, if we want to sustain our merchant marine, we're either going to have to, we're going to go with what we got. We're going to hopefully have some time to build some new, or if hostilities start, we're going to grab whoever's in port, like we did in World War One. Uh, you know, paint over uh, the home port, put New York or San Diego on it, run up the stars and stripes, and now it's one. Now it's our. Uh, you know, that's not going to be, and they're, they're probably not going to be the right kinds of ships. But you know, we're going to be needing ships, and we're going to be needing a lot of them. Hopefully, we can, uh, you know, get our industrial base. Uh, charged up enough that we can build some. We're not going to build 250. That's for darn sure. So it's going to have to be a combination of purpose-built ships that we build here that are, you know, focused capability. Uh, some that we take up out of trade, uh, and others that we, uh, you know, kind of as as the Navy's kind of and them and Marat are doing now, bringing in uh, ships that are currently trading and uh, and flagging them in uh, so that we. Uh, can, can increase our fleet that way. It's going to take really all of those solutions, uh, but yeah. increasing the industrial base, I think, is has got to be, I think, an important part of what we're doing here of this focus. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. And, and completely agree. We have to figure it out. Um, and uh, um, it is, you know, absolutely critical for lots of reasons. So. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, let me just mention we have uh, uh, on the schedule or just our scheduling now uh, the next event in this series, um, and, and that will be on March 13th at 1:30 p.m. We have uh, former chairman of the Transportation Committee Peter DeFazio joining us for a conversation um, about the maritime industry. Uh, details to be uh, determined. Um, and that will be a live event here at the Hudson Institute, and it will be live streamed also. So in-person attendance will be welcomed and encouraged on, on March 13th. And, and then you'll also be able to watch it live uh, at that time also. So please mark your calendars. And if you, if you want further information about the program, uh, please uh, email me again at, at mroberts at uh, hudson.org. And no more plugs here. <laughs> but thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so much, Admiral Busby. Really, really great comments and, and insights. And uh, um, we'll look forward to working with you further on these issues. I look forward to seeing more U.S. flagships out there. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.